me and a friend um, practice stretching and meditation. It looks uh, like a sort of very amateurish and dilettantish sort of yoga. Um, we're about the same age. We're both starting to feel our body seize up. And we've decided that we're going to do something to sort of, I don't know, forestall it. We both plan to, you know, stay as young as possible for as long as possible. And as a result, we've gravitated, as many people our age have, towards things like stretching and whatever. Um, with my interest in Eastern philosophy and in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, um... There's a ready-made mythos, I guess, surrounding all that stuff in my mind already. Um, I don't believe in any of it. Um, I don't believe in Lord Shiva. I don't believe in uh, uh, cosmic consciousness. I don't believe in any of this stuff. But I have scoliosis. A lot of my meditation, a lot of my stretching, a lot of my various and sundry poses. It, oftentimes when I'm doing it, it looks a lot more like Qigong or Tai Chi than it does actually uh, yoga. But the point is to straighten out my spine and put it in nice alignment. Um, feels much better and uh, my body feels much more, I don't know, fresh and supple and movable and everything when my spine is straight. When you start to manipulate your spine, um, even in small ways like I do, I don't try and do anything too radical, but you start to notice things. If you do <clears throat> this to your spine, you feel it in your left ankle. If you go <clears throat> in your spine, you feel it right behind your eyeballs, that kind of thing. I don't know, I guess you're just sort of fiddling with nerves and nerves go everywhere and, you know, yada, yada, yada. It's like the old thing every teenager notices when you <clears throat> squeeze it on your, say, your face, you feel a little twinge of itch slash pain on the inside of your left thigh or something like this. It's just, you know, your body, your nervous system seems to work that way. So <clears throat> this leads me to things like chakra and kundalini and things like that. Um, you know, that crazy diagram that you see of the energy points and stuff like that in your body all the way down starts at your spine base of your spine works all the way up to the top of your head and then there's another chakra above the top of your head personally i think that there's no such thing but when you start to manipulate your spine you start to notice hmm maybe these people were talking metaphorically maybe they were just saying you know for the ease of conversation we're going to invent these things called chakras and we're going to sort of say this is what this chakra really is. It's just a poetic way of referring to something that happens in your body. There's no subtle body there, but when you do A, B happens, you want to talk about it, you want to explore it, so you identify all these little points in your body. You create identities for these um, areas where certain things happen when you do certain things with your spine. The Raja Yogis of India, the tantrics of Kashmir and Tibet and that have got an entire literature on chakras, kundalini, all this kind of thing. Now you look at that and you go, arcane rubbish, don't believe any of it. Neither do I. <laughs> but you'd be surprising how useful their vocabulary is when you're trying to talk about what happens when you manipulate your spine. Whether you like it or not, they've developed a vocabulary for talking about stuff like that. So my friend and I discuss this. And you start to sort of fall into a little bit of a linguistic rut when you do that. Uh, you start to just offhandedly refer to certain things using that kind of um, language, that kind of metaphor, metaphoric language. Um, this is very common in Indian literature. Uh, apparently, pi was discovered by an Indian mathematician uh, before it was discovered by whoever, whatever Greek was supposed to have noticed it. Um, and he wrote about it in a poem, in a song. <laughs> um, interesting mixture of the mundane and the arcane, the artistic and the uh, 
the scientific, the, I don't know what you'd call it, Dionysian and Apollonian. Um, but what happens over usage of time is you catch yourself referring to certain things in that exclusively, I don't know what you'd call it, religious language. And we go <laughs> as though we've just caught ourselves kind of embarrassed as though, you know, we want to back off and say, look, I'm using this language, but I don't want to <laughs> subscribe to any of that mumbo jumbo. I don't believe in all of that stuff that when people talk about it in a strictly arcane manner, there's no subtle body. There's no chakras. There's no uh, Kundalini. There's none of this stuff. But look at the language they've developed to discuss what happens when you start fiddling with your nervous system. Now, this is another instance where identity becomes some sort of deification. I just want to make my nervous system work more smoothly. All I want is a straight spine. All I want is a straight spine in order to be able to manipulate my body as carelessly as, is, as, as I can at my age. Um, I want to calm my mind down. I want to avoid anxiety. I want to improve my concentration. I want all this kind of thing. So as a result, I've started to manipulate my body. I've started to, well, I've always sort of tried to manipulate my mind. I've tried, you know, I try and keep my mind on a fixed point, meditation, if you want to call it that, whatever. I want to talk about it with somebody else who has similar interests, who's at almost an identical spot in his life. He's about five years younger than I am, but his wife has just given birth to his first child. So, you know, we have very similar interests in that regard. We also have a very, very similar interest in near pornographic, scatological, racist humor, slapstick stuff at its guy humor worst, which we keep to ourselves and we don't let anyone else overhear us speaking because we don't want to be to be taken the wrong way. But we like shock humor. <laughs> I always have. Um, that's kind of just a little aside to sort of say that we're just kind of average people here. But <clears throat> the point is. We want to achieve a certain goal. There are tools at our disposal to do that. If we had the knee-jerk sort of stay away from that religious gobbledygook, we would just close the book on that and we wouldn't have anything to do with it. We'd just say, that is rubbish. Which, in a sense, I still, I still have. That, that sort of recoiling from religious rubbish is still there. I had a Catholic education inflicted upon me. That will do it to anybody. Um, so I just sort of, I'm automatically, my mind is on guard, but occasionally when you're talking about it, almost in spite of yourself, you suspend that sort of fear of, and I won't say infection, but that sort of healthy distance that you like to keep between yourself and this religious type language. Although some people would say that Raja yoga or Hatha yoga is not really religious, although I find that a hard sell because in India, everything's religious, including mathematics and science. Um, but ease of discussion, ease of conversation leads us to adopt a certain vocabulary which religious people have already developed for us. Let's just say that our progress started to accelerate to the point where we really wanted to just sort of make some major progress here. And we started just, okay, we've both established that we don't believe in any of this, but we're going to use this language. Fair enough. So let's just leave that point alone. Let's stop reminding ourselves that we're talking, that we're using essentially bogus language to talk about something that's strictly physical and you know, scientifically verifiable. Let's just say that when, whenever I talk about chakras, kundalini, uh, uh, energy points or whatever, that we both know that we're not really talking about something that's real, that we believe is actually there. It's just a metaphor for something. <clears throat> Let's just forget about that and stop stumbling over that little sort of moment of, ha ha ha, aren't we dumb? We're talking religion when we, we, we both said that we think it's rubbish. Let's suspend that because we want to make progress. We don't, don't want to keep going back and reminding ourselves. 
What'll happen over several years of doing this? The human mind is a funny thing. <laughs> um, I keep bringing up Orwell's quote, the past is erased, the erasure is forgotten. The lie becomes the truth and then becomes a lie again. Um, if we've agreed that we're going to stop sort of reminding ourselves that we're using bogus sort of religious language for something that neither of us actually believe, what happens to that concept? Let's say that we're just talking about the base chakra or whatever. It's just, that's the base of your spine. Now, I'm fascinated by the base of my spine simply because at my age, the muscles are all contracting slightly, but they are contracting. So the point that I, or what, what I find I like to do is to extend all of my muscles, all of my limbs this way in sort of that, you know, that famous picture of uh, Leonardo da Vinci with the guy with his arms out like this, extend all four limbs as far as possible and try and pull the back of your spine up towards the ceiling. Feels really good because you're extending all of your muscles. You're stretching all of those muscles at once that are contracting. Get a nice little shot of endorphins too when you do that. Um, <clears throat> now, the fulcrum of the entire body seems to be the base of the spine. That's sort of the point where, that's sort of the, um, the center of the diameter that is formed by doing this. It seems to be the base of the spine. That is one of the classic chakras, the first one, the lowest one. We talk about that. What happens if we get careless? What happens if we just keep talking about it and we don't remind ourselves that we're talking, that we're using metaphoric language? And let's say that somebody else gets interested in what we're doing after we've already established that we don't need to revisit the fact that we don't really believe all of this. It's something subtle happens. <laughs> and um, what is, what you, what you laughed at last year you sort of provisionally said, okay, we laughed at it, but they kind of have a point, at least if you take what they say metaphorically. And then ease of use means you don't keep telling yourself that you're talking metaphorically because it's assumed in between two people that you're talking metaphorically. But after a while, the mind gets lazy. The mind stops thinking that way because you you really got other goals. Um, it almost, <laughs> if you're not sort of cognizant. A lot of people might say if you're not careful, but I don't want to worry about it. I don't want anxiety to sort of, you know, make me recoil from this. I just want to remain aware of where my mind is going as opposed to actually um, fearing what, uh, you know, fearing pollution, if you know what I mean. I want to stay in control of what my mind is doing as opposed to fear the loss of control. Not the same thing. <clears throat> but let's just say that that suspension of sort of cynicism about chakras, about kundalini, about you know, the subtle body and all that. Let's say that we just stop talking about that. After a while, these things take on some kind of a reality. Because you're just so used to talking about them, assuming that the, that the word that you're used is understood in the context that you use it. In, in other words, I'm talking about what the ancient tantras would call the chakra at the base of your spine. I don't believe that there's such a thing, but I do believe that there is a fulcrum at my body, in, in my body that when I extend all of my muscles in a certain way, I can get it at maximum extension. Okay, I believe that that mathematically, I suppose, there is a, a sort of a fulcrum there of my body. And for ease of discussion, I refer to it as that chakra. I don't even know what it's called, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but we do refer to that because, again, we've, we're both at about the same age and our body is doing the same thing. If we keep talking like this, I often get the impression that we're going to start sort of, I don't know, the lie is going to become something of a truth. That chakra's existence might be established in our minds. <laughs> um, the law of identity seems to work that way. For ease of discussion, we're going to assume that identity exists that identity is a viable concept for ease of discussion. But if you're not cognizant of the fact that you're doing this, you get to the point where chakras become real. I'm not at that point. Um, but again, I, of I often say that I don't have that fear of infection, but what I do have is I have 
um, desire to remain in control of this at all times. I want to be able to sort of, if necessary, go back and say, yes, I know this is all just a metaphor for simple changes in my central nervous system. That's all it is. But if I want to talk about it, there's a vocabulary there waiting for me to talk to, to use to discuss this. I have not established the existence of chakras simply because a metaphor has been prepared for me by somebody else who was religious, who was using the language of gods and religion and everything like that. Um, identity is tricky. Demonstration or tautological demonstration, i.e., this fulcrum in my body does exist. I do get a shot of endorphins when I do this. Therefore, it's safe to say that that chakra or that exists. It doesn't. There's no such thing. But the seeds of the error are there. Or the seeds of, one might not even call that an error. The seeds of, I would call it a derailment of what I wanted to do when I got into this. The seeds of the derailment are in there the second that you decide that you're going to start talking about something as though it actually exists. A fulcrum is just a concept. The fulcrum at the base of my spine is simply the center of all the pressure in my body. And when I extend my arms and legs this way, the very center of the sort of expanding thing that I have become is the base of my spine. The base of my spine is just a point that I have decided is there. It's not phenomenally there. Um, but again, I talk about it as though it is. This is what happens when you give things an identity. This is the Hindu concept of Maya. It's not so much an illusion as it is a misidentification. You give something a name in order to discuss it. You simply want you simply want to make something discussable. You give it a name. That name, through ease and carelessness of use, becomes a thing. It doesn't just have to be things like chakras and gods and whatever. It can be this tube of toothpaste. It can be anything that you decide is. Um, that's why I say identity ends up being a matter of arcane, of the arcane. It, it ends up being a matter of faith if you're not careful. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm kind of playing with fire, but I, again, my curiosity generally trumps my fear of infection. In fact, it easily trumps it. In fact, I don't really have much of a fear of infection. But there's always that sense that, okay, I've got to keep balance here between ease of use and credulity. I have to be able to understand what I'm doing at all times. I want to remain in control of the situation. I want to use the vocabulary that theistic thought systems have worked out for us, but I want to see it for what it is. Some people might say that I am playing with fire, and next thing you know, I'm going to be in a monastery in northern India. Doubt it. Um, I don't think that one can split uh, the universe that way. Um... I don't think that identity is a dangerous concept. It's a useful concept, but you've got to be very careful with it. 